Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we glorify you, O oh Lord. Lord, we're in awe of your glory, O oh God. It's the great I am. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We glorify your name, O oh God. We lift up that name, the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, not only that you're the great I am, but you are also our heavenly Father, O oh God. Lord, what a treasure we have in you, Lord Jesus. And God, we ask that you continue to be with us now, Lord, as we open up your living word, O oh God. O oh, great I am, speak to us, O oh God. Speak to us in that inner workings of our heart so that not only will we hear it, but Lord, we will understand it. Not only will we understand it, but God, that you would give us the power to live your word, O oh Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord another hand clap offering. You may be seated. Amen. At this time, we're going to dismiss the children. I'm getting it right after about a year of doing this. I'm remembering. So I don't want them to go. But they're going to their uh, children's ministry cl class where they're going to be learning about Jesus from our very uh, gifted teachers who love the Lord. Amen? It's wonderful to know that while we're in here learning and growing in Christ, that our children are learning and growing in Christ as well. Amen? I want to talk to you about something that uh, the Lord placed on my heart. It's something I think a lot about, and it's about the condition of our uh, souls, the condition of us as Christians. I believe that we are the most uh, uh, blessed and screaming, no, <laughs> we're the most blessed and gifted uh, a people on the face of the earth. We're so blessed to know the truth that sets men free. And um, the, the, what Jesus did for us is incredible, but sometimes we don't experience everything that he meant for us to experience because of things that we don't know, or we stop short, or there's a lot of reasons why that happens, but they have nothing to do with what God did because he did it all. He completed the whole work. As a matter of fact, Jesus said on the cross, remember what he said when he died, it is finished. And that finished work on the cross means a lot more uh, for us than we normally uh, sometimes live out. And uh, I was thinking about as I drive by sometimes, sometimes I go to a place that I'm used to going to a lot, and I see a sign on a building or the sign on the place where I'm used to going, and it says uh, these three words, under new management. How many have ever uh, gone to a place you're used to going and you see a sign like that, and you go, uh-oh, why do you go, oh, because under new management means it's going to be different than what you were used to. It's going to be different. Things are going to change. There might be different people in there. They might do things a different way. There might be, if it's a restaurant, a different menu. The decorations usually change and the way the place looks under new management. Now, what is the reason for being under new management. There's two reasons that I can think of. Number one, the old management wasn't working. So you need new management, the way that someone was doing something, or maybe the way that they were serving people, or the way uh, that maybe there was too many complaints. So the, it wasn't working, so they had to bring in a new management. The other instance is that the business was sold, and now there's a new owner, and now it's under new management, and that new owner is going to do things his way. I have a story about uh, my favorite, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, I'm Hispanic, but I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, and I got used to uh, kosher meat. Because when you eat kosher meat, it's unlike anything else. The Hebrew National says this, that they, they can't cheat when they do sausages and stuff because they answer to a 
higher authority. By law, they cannot put fillers in sausage. Like if you have, I don't want to mess up your view of sausages and frankfurters, but there's stuff in there that you probably don't want to know about. But it tastes good, doesn't it? It tastes good. I'm eating it. I'm sorry. I'm eating it. <laughs> but when you have a kosher sausage or kosher salami or a kosher frankfurter, it's pure 100% beef because they can't cheat because of the, the, the laws, the Old Testament laws. And you're going to pay, not Old Testament money, you're going to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> well, one, I used to go to this kosher deli that was right around the corner from where I live. Just, I just, a two-minute walk. And I always had a little job. When I, was, uh, when I was a kid, I always found a way to work, and I always had a little money in my pocket. That sandwich back in the day cost $8.50 for a pastrami sandwich. But it was like this. I mean, that was a pastrami sandwich. And it was like all full of fat or anything else. I used to work later on in a, 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 my cousin owned a meat, uh, wholesale meat business. I used to run the financial part for him. I would not, I could get it real cheap. I would not eat that pastrami. Had to be kosher pastrami. Well, one day, I went to, I mean, this is years of going there to the same place. The place was Lulu's. That was the name of the place, Lulu's. One day I walked in there, and it was a guy named Lulu. He was the owner. I walked in there, and there was a sign under new management. I said, uh-oh. Now, in this case, it wasn't a good thing because I ordered my pastrami sandwich, and it was like this. And they still charged me $8.50, which I was not happy about, and I didn't go back. So in that case, the new management was worse than the old management, and didn't, they went, wound up going out of business. But usually, when some place goes under new management, it's because the business was in trouble or it wasn't working out. And I want to talk about the change in management that happened when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. In case you didn't know it, you went from an old management to a new management. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 read like this. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you, ha whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Let's say that together. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Okay, do you get that? It's very clear, isn't it? The Bible doesn't mince words. God is very direct in what he tells us. He wants you to know that, yes, we were in trouble. Yes, we needed to be redeemed. So he did redeem us. But you are not your own anymore. You're under new management. He paid a price for you. And it was a premium price. It was the highest price. He didn't haggle about it. He gave the most he could give. His life here on earth. Spilled his blood on the cross. There is no higher price that could be paid. But he paid it. So now you and me, once we receive Jesus, we do not own ourselves. And since we don't own ourselves, we shouldn't walk around like we do. How many say amen? I want to talk to you about what being under new management means and what it should look like. First of all, being under new management means that you are done with sin. You're done with it. Not, uh, 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 you know, well, I'll play around with it a little bit or, uh, you know, most of the time I won't do it. You're done with it. The old management was you. And now there's a new management. God is your new manager. Listen what it says in Romans chapter 6, verses 2 and 4. Who are those that have died to sin? How can we, I'm sorry, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may do what? 
may live a new life. Listen, let me tell you this. Let me save you all a lot of heartache and a lot of time. God made it so that you can be done with sin. And it's not a payment plan or a, 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 you know, a, a plan where you have to take care of it little by little. You know, I know that sometimes we think, well, I just won't do as much of it as I used to do. I'll do it less and less until finally I one day won't do it anymore. And that doesn't work. Once you have that connection plugged into the wrong power source, there will always be mayhem in your life. Let's say, for example, that before you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, you were a bank robber. You robbed banks. And now you're saved. And you say to yourself, well, instead of robbing 12 banks this year, I'll just rob six. Or instead of stealing $200,000, I'll just take $50,000. Right? That kind of thinking, when you think of it that way, doesn't seem to make any sense, does it? No, what do you have to do if you were robbing banks before? You have to stop. If you were stealing or picking pockets, you don't pick less pockets. You pick no pockets. Right? There is a change. So think of everything that uh, is going on in your life. God meant to liberate you 100%. And the, pow the power shortage is not in God. It's in us not trusting him and not uh, uh, relying on him to free us because the Bible tells me and you that whom the Son sets free is free. But obviously there are other kind of things that we get involved in that we need help, such as chemical addictions and things like that, but we need to get help. We don't need to play around or fool around with it. There's help to be gotten in a lot of Christian places that we can go. In other words, we got to deal with our stuff. How many say amen? You know, I tell you that, and uh, sometimes we don't talk like that from the pulpit anymore, but that's not, uh, that's not to harm any of us. That's to, so that we won't, we'll be free. Amen? If we do what the Bible says, it doesn't hurt anybody. You are free. And it's an amazing thing to not be tied into anything. Anything that's going to either ruin our lives or ruin our health or ruin our relationships or ruin something. Because that's what sin does. How many say amen? So you're under new management, you're done with it. Find a way to be done with it, and the way is getting power from God to be done with it. Being under new management also means a total takeover and a total makeover. It's a total makeover. You ever see those shows where somebody goes in, sometimes hideous looking, pardon that I should got to admit that. And out pops another person looking pretty good. Or a normal looking person and they come out looking beautiful. It's called a total makeover. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Here's our total makeover. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become what? A what? A new person. The old life is gone. And a new life has begun. Notice the verb tense. The old life is gone. Have you ever been gone from someplace? When you're gone from someplace, you're no longer there. And a new life has begun, not will begun one day in the sweet by and by, or maybe will begin. It has begun. Do you realize that when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit as a deposit, and now you have what's necessary to be able to live a new life. The new life is inside of you. It's Jesus. A new life. 
You have to let that new life out by letting go of the old. It's gone. Consider it gone. How many say amen? That new life, that whole makeover should affect and infect everything about you. It should infect everything. Everything that you were before is affected by this new life. How you used to talk. How you used to think. The words that you used to use. The places that you used to go. The people that you used to hang out with. The things that you did for, for, for pleasure. That changes. What you watched on TV. What you listened to on the radio. What kind of music you listen to. How you speak to your wife, how you speak to your children, how you speak to your friends, how you honor authority now. It changes everything about you if that new life has begun. And I've met people like that all throughout my life where they were one way before Christ and now they're a totally different way in Christ. You wouldn't know or pick out what they used to do before they found Jesus. You wouldn't be able to say, as a matter of fact, if you tell somebody, they'll say, wait a minute. You, you're telling me that him, he used to? No. You got to be kidding me. Listen, in where I came from, it was, uh, you know, the church was downtown Brooklyn. And if you just, all you got to do is walk around the streets in downtown Brooklyn, and you're going to find some characters right away. You don't have to look for them. People actually walk on the streets in downtown Brooklyn. That's something we don't do around here. We don't walk on streets here. In fact, they don't even have streets in most places. There's no street out here, right? But they have these streets, and there's people milling all around. And there are some characters. And sometimes those characters would come into the church for I don't know what, but they would get saved and their lives would be totally transformed from people that lived on the streets to people who, who dealt drugs to people that were involved in high crime and misdemeanors. Now totally changed. People that couldn't be trusted now, head of security at the church. I mean, that's just the kind of transformation that God does. I'm thinking of somebody right now that was head of security. You wouldn't want to meet this guy. You wouldn't want to let him know you even have a wallet in your pocket. And he was the one watching out for everything. That's the kind of change. It's a total makeover. It's a miracle. It's not anything mundane. It's not something, oh, yeah, he, say, he wasn't saved before he's saved now. Yeah, well, yeah. No, it's like, whoa, what happened to that person? He's totally different. It's, it's changed what's going on. That's what people should say about us. You know, as we walk around, even uh, if they know you for a long time, just the way that you live should have people scratching their heads. How did he react like that? That person just insult, insulted him, huh? How did, what's that about? Hey, listen, this is a powerful thing. Under new management, and that management ain't no joke. How many say amen? So you're done with sin, and it's a total makeover. Being under new management also means that Jesus is in charge now. He's in charge. Not you, not me. You don't tell him where to go. Here's how most of us uh, live our lives. I'm going here now, God. Follow me. Come on. I'm going over there. I'm going to do this. I'm selling my house. I'm moving to Kentucky. I want a house by the lake. I'm doing it. Come. And people who have done that have learned that Jesus doesn't respond to this. You just took a very lonely walk, and you're probably going to face some stuff on your own if you left outside of God's will. 
You know, the picture, I've said it before, in the Old Testament of how the Jewish people lived when they were in the desert was awesome. They followed the pillar of cloud, which had fire in it at night. And if that cloud moved, they moved. If that cloud stopped, they stopped and they camped out. It could be a day, it could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a year. They watched it. And as soon as it would start to move, up, oh, come on, time to break camp. Got to go. Where are we going? I don't know. We're following the cloud. It hasn't changed. Precious people, it hasn't changed. You've got to follow the cloud of God's presence. I'll tell you why. It's very simple. You don't know where you're going. You have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone talk about even when you get out of here. You have plans when you get out of here? I got plans. I don't know what's going to happen. I hope I'm going to get to do the plans, but you know, if God wills, we'll do the plan, right? But you got to stay loose because God knows everything, and he just might change it on you. And if you're insistent, then there's a reason why he'll change it on you. But you cannot have the cloud follow you. You have to see where God is leading, and you follow it. How many say amen? amen. Let me read you some scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.15, talking about Jesus. He died for everyone so that those who receive his, this new life or his new life will no longer live for themselves. Hello. There it is. So that when you receive this new life, you no longer live for yourself. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So you stop living the way that you did before, under new management. Now you're not living for yourself, you're living for him. But I got news for you. When you live for him, you'll have the best life down here. Because he loves you. He doesn't need one thing from me or you. The reason he wants us to follow him is because he knows where you need to go, and we don't. So he loves us so much that he says, now look, when you live for yourself, you will ruin yourself. How many know what that means? How many have been there, done that? If I could raise the other leg, I would, but I'd fall right in front of you. Listen, we've done it, haven't we? Everybody's done it. We all know what it's like to live for ourselves. And we're here because it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's horrible. We can't even have a decent real relationship. How hard could it be for a man to live with a woman in a marriage relationship? How hard could that be? It's easy, right, guys? That wasn't a joke. Oh, it's not so easy. But it's not because there's anything wrong with marriage or with women or with men for that matter. It's that we have a serious, serious issue. When we live for ourselves, we also live for ourselves in a relationship. Whether you try to hide the fact or not, you're in it to see how things can go your way. How many know what I'm talking about? Don't you look all innocent on me. I know. <laughs> I know because I know me. You want, that's what every, all the contention is. His way, her way, the highway, and God's way. And we're all fight for it unless... You know, I, uh, my wife and I found out the secret of all of that mess when God got a hold of us is that she might have her way, and she does. She's from the Bronx. Trust me, she has her way. <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn, and I have mine. Okay, the Brooklyn meets the Bronx. <laughs> Not a pretty picture in the natural but since she has her way and Brooklyn has his way, we don't lose if we both look for God's way. That's not just a pretty saying. It's how we live our lives. Sometimes God's way is the way she was thinking. 
Sometimes God's way is the way I was thinking. That's why we pray and ask. Sometimes we both missed it. And God has his way, which we didn't think about. That's why we want his way. Why would I want my way if it's not the right way? Or why would she want her way if it's not the right way? Jesus in charge. Proverbs 16.3 tells us this. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Oh, man, we got to do more of that. You know, even if you have a plan, you know, we have to have some kind of plan. We can't just ran, go randomly through life, but you have to have this way. Lord, I'm planning to do this. God, I'm putting this is what I'm planning to do. God is the best that I can discern. But Lord, if this is not it, would you show me or would you stop me? Did you ever pray like that? You know, there's sometimes, uh, you know, that we have to make a decision and we've prayed and we think we have the best, but we know what, we're not putting all our chips there. We're saying, God, if this is not you, would you stop us? I, I, I tell about the time that we were looking uh, to buy a house when we first moved here. It was the height of the, the real estate uh, market, and we couldn't afford a house uh, at all. They wanted like $500,000 for a shack. Seriously. Half a million dollars for, uh, you know, I couldn't get my toe into the house. So we decided, you know what? I'm from Brooklyn. You know what we do in Brooklyn? We rent. Everybody, most, everybody lives in apartments in Brooklyn. So I grew up in an apartment. Hey, let's just rent. You know, so we did that. I enjoyed that for a while. If something would break, hello. Is this the management? Could you come and fix such and such? You can't do that when you have a house. You'd be calling yourself, hello. <laughs> you better get some money. <laughs> And I didn't have to shovel the snow. Believe me, it was no heartache. We, we, we rented for four years. But then um, the housing market crashed. And, uh, you know, someone who we trusted and loved told us, hey, you got to look for a house. You go, we, we don't need a house. You got just, you know, it would be good, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, my, my sons are musicians. The one thing, you live in an apartment, you cannot play the drums. How many know that? You can't play the drums in an apartment. Or somebody will come play the drums on you. You know, and all that racket we make, that's one thing. But anyway, so, so we thought about it. Okay, we were looking, we found this place. I mean, we're looking and looking and looking. There were a lot of empty places that people had abandoned and stuff. So we looked at this townhouse that was empty for six months, and not one person had looked at it. It was nice. It was near the church, and everything, you know, they had remodeled it and everything. It was beautiful. Everybody loved it. The kids loved it. And so we prayed. And we put in an offer, and it was accepted, and we prayed. And I remember the night before we were going to sign the contract. And uh, we were praying. We had our family time of prayer. And my son, Joey, he must have been about 14 at the time or something. Who? Younger than that. Okay. Well, anyway, we were praying, and he let out in prayer. Now, they loved the house. They had a whole basement where they could do whatever. And he started praying. And I guess he had learned from us praying that. He said, Lord, we really like that house, Lord. But, Lord, if it's not you, if it's not your will, Lord, we don't want it. It's, we're just praying. I'm saying, wow, way to go. Timmy, you remember that prayer? You remember that prayer. So then we're on our way. To sign the contract. Ring, ring. Yes, pick up. It's the real estate agent. Don't bother going. What happened? Somebody just put a bid higher than yours. Now, six months, nobody had looked at the place. Nobody. I was the first one. And two days later, someone not only comes and looks at it, they want it, and they put bid more money than me. So the guy said, you're going to pay any more? No. I said, that's it. That's all I got. So... We hung up the phone, and you know what we did? We had a little celebration in the car. We did. Yay, God. Tell me that's not intervention. Intervention, that's what we ask. God, he intervened. He must know something that we don't know. The funny thing about it was that the person who outbid me was the pastor from another large church 
just five minutes from where we were. That dirty little... No. <laughs> I was just kidding. Scratch that from the tape. Could you rewind the tape? <laughs> Oh, God, heaping coals on his head, heaping coals. No. <laughs> but you know what? I found out later that it fell through for him as well. And then I didn't know why, but I found, I had, you don't always find out why. I found out that it would have been a huge mistake, a huge mistake for us. And I thank God. But we were able to thank him even before knowing because we trust him because of what we've learned. Amen? So. Uh, James chapter 4, listen to what it says here. Verse 13, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. How clear can it be? The Bible says you're just a mist. I never do this because I don't like when it's done to me. But turn to your neighbor and say, you are a mist. <laughs> not a mess. You're not, you're not a mess. A mist. <laughs> Jesus is in charge now. You let him take over. How many say amen? Being under new management also means making radical choices. Making radical choices. Things get radical. There will be decisions that you have to make that might not seem like they're going to help you. It might seem like if you make that decision based on what God's word says, you're going to have to deal with some stuff. You're going to have to deal with some financial stuff. Now everything has to be on the up and up, and it might mean that you pay more taxes or, or you have to, uh, uh, you know, not try to uh, bargain down to the basements because you know how much something really costs. If you find a lot of money and it has a number on it, you don't try to throw away the envelope so that you won't have to return it. You live life, different radical choices, where you work. What if you, you got saved and you were working in a strip club? What do you do with that? But that's how you, you provide. What do you do with that? I know people, you know what? God has to help me. I'm just leaving that place. I can't be there anymore. God is going to have to provide another job. And you know what? They left and they didn't get a job right away. You ever hear stories like that? It's not always so cut and dry. Oh, yeah, you know, I just left and, you know, I went uh, the next day and I became CEO of the, you know, Morgan Stanley. No, you don't hear stories like that. But you hear uh, people that persevered and they waited and somehow, some way, God provided. You know, it was tough and, you know, they had to pray and, and it, it got, you know, their backs were against the wall for a little bit. And all of a sudden God provided. And then all of a sudden here comes the breakthrough and God puts them where they're supposed to be. And he honors what their decision was and their life just blossoms and grows. That's the way it works. You know, I was reading a book uh, called Radical by Pastor David Platt, and uh, this pastor was unique in that he was uh, hired, he didn't start the church, but he was hired to take over this mega church, I forget what state it was in, it was somewhere down south, and it was said at that time that he was the youngest pastor to pastor a mega church at that time. But he had, before taking that position, had done some traveling, doing some missionary work, seeing how Christians who are under persecution live and how they would uh, hide or, or go into their meeting place at different times so that it won't not to raise suspicion that there was a meeting going on. And maybe they had a page of the Bible, not the whole Bible, and how these Christians were risking their lives out of their love for Jesus and how they would find ways to spread the gospel without trying to get killed. And now here 
he starts at this mega church and he sees a, you know, playground and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, the, the moon bounces and, and, and the coffee centers and all of that. And not that you shouldn't have a good time with all that stuff, but the contrast was kind of a, a very, very stark. I mean, it was just night and day, the contrast with Christians and how they lived and what we have here. And it seemed to him like it was more uh, Christianity out of comfort and convenience. But if we ask those folks or us to follow or to, to do something hard or difficult, then they might get up and leave and go to another church that has a bigger moon bounce or something like that. And he wrote something that I, I want to read to you. It's a quote from him and from that book. It says this, Radical obedience to Christ is not easy. It's not comfort. It's not health. It's not wealth. And it's not prosperity in this world. Radical obedience to Christ risks losing all of these things. But in the end, such risk finds its reward in Christ. And he is more than enough for us. We need to get radical with our faith. As a matter of fact, if you don't, if you're not radical, if it doesn't affect everything, the one who will suffer is you and me if I don't. If obeying Christ radically is too much for you, then there's too much of you in the equation. If following Christ radically, and because Christ said it, you're going to do it, if that's too much for you, then there's still too much of you under management. Because if Christ is under management, he will give you the strength to make what seems to be a hard decision. But it only is a hard decision for our flesh. It is not a hard decision for our soul and our spirit because that decision will take us to glory. That decision will put us on the narrow road that leads to righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That decision will make God's eyes stop at you. Second Chronicles 16.9 says the eyes of the Lord were to and fro over all the earth, searching out for a heart that's fully committed to him so that he can strengthen it. That's what it says. And when you make radical choices like that, his eyes stop at you. Oh, there's one. There's somebody who will follow me with a full heart. I'm going to strengthen Matt. I'm going to strengthen him so that people will know there's nothing impossible for me. There, there, there was a way he lived before, but watch him now because I'm going to fill him with not only my strength, I'm going to give him the joy of the Lord that is his strength, and I'm going to give him the victory in life. Let me talk about radical, okay? Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus was radical. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Read it again tonight. It is radical. It's radical thinking. It's not messing around. It's straight talk. It's foreign language to a lot of people. But listen to this. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. That's radical. That's unbelievable that he would say something like that. But what is he talking about? You have to understand the language of the Holy Spirit. You have to understand and not read this like a book because if you read it like a book, you'd probably walk away from, from, after reading that particular verse. But here's what God is saying. You need me. You need my love in your life. And there's only one way. It's I have to be in total control. I have to be first, or otherwise you will destroy yourself or go the wrong way. And there's only one way. You have to love me more than anything or anybody. Do you love your wife? Good. Love your wife. You're supposed to. It's a command. But if you love her more than me, you'll get in trouble. You love your children? Good. If you want to do good for your children and love them, really love God with all of your heart, and you will bless the mess out of your children. You love your mom and dad? 
You need to love God first so you can have wisdom after you have your own family with how you're supposed to deal with mom and dad. Do you understand the language now? And it's supposed to be so much more that it would even seem like hatred. So that if something or family that doesn't know the Lord, they want you to participate in something that you don't do anymore. Some rowdy parties where there's drinking and carousing and all of that. You don't go and say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but you know, it's my family. Got to understand, you know. Or you get married, you know, well... We don't drink and we don't get drunk, but you know, my family get upset if we don't have liquor at the... Hey, who are you living for? Can I talk straight? Who do you want to please? You want to please your family? You want to please that uncle that lives in Connecticut? That he's going to go back there and keep getting drunk and you probably won't see him, maybe once every three years or something? Or do you want to please the God who will be living in you? The God who saved you. The God who paid the price of his life for you. It's radical. I'm not talking out of my own head. Trust me, I'm just like everybody else. I learned a lot about myself, and it wasn't good. That's why we need to get radical. I need radical. If I don't have radical, I'll be just the same. I can't play around with the stuff that I'm made of because there's sin in the very fibers of my flesh. So I need something radical. I need to turn my life over completely to God so that something else could come out until I see him face to face. Then I don't have to worry about it anymore. But right now, I need radical. I need radical faith. I need to follow him radically. People need to know. Let me tell you something. I'll say this, and she will say the same thing. I love and respect my wife as a woman of God. She is a woman of God. She's a gift to me. But if one day she would pick up and get away from the Lord and say, if you don't Stop going to church. If you don't stop being a pastor, if you don't leave that and just come with me and we'll do something else, I'm leaving you. Through tears and through pleading, I would say, I can't. You're going to have to go. As much as I love her. And she would do the same, wouldn't you, babe? I would expect her to do that. If I turned from the faith and wanted to pull her with me, I expect her to say, I'm not going with you. Because I love the one who gave his life for me. And I'm not turning away from the one who gives me life. I'm not following you into Death Valley. I'm not doing it. We have to be radical in our faith. Finally, being under new management means a new destiny. A new destiny. Before we were destined for destruction. But now listen to our destiny. I'm going to read a few verses here. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now he looks at, he says, Here, here's who you are. You're my handiwork. Let me do work in you because I'm, I'm, I'm doing under new management, I'm changing things. The menu is different. The, the selection is different. Because I have works for you to do, which, by the way, I've prepared in advance. He already knows what they are. And you're going to do them in power. And in doing those good works, you're going to live a blessed life. You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Then there's Psalm 138.8. The Lord will work out his plans for my life or your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. 1 John 5.13. John speaking, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And finally, 1 John 2.17. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. That is your new destiny. That's my new destiny. That's your trajectory. That's where we're headed. We're not, listen, 
you know, I, I think about this every time I, 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 one of my dear friends or a brother or sister in Christ that I know goes on to be with the Lord. I think about that. You know what I was thinking? I'll let you into my thoughts about this. I was thinking this a few days ago. I was thinking, you know, about the few moments before you're going to glory, if you're uh, um, fortunate enough to or blessed enough to know that you're going. Sometimes you're in a bed and you know, okay, you don't have much longer here. But I was thinking, man, what would I feel? You're a little nervous, you know, because I'm heading off to really known but unknown. What I know is pretty glorious. But I know it's not even scratching the surface. But I was thinking about how my heart would be beating with anticipation. Oh, my goodness. In a few moments, I'm going to be in the very presence of God. In a few moments, this will all be over. In a few moments, I'm going to be looking at Jesus face to face. And I'm going to be in glory where the air I breathe will be holiness. And, and there, there will be no sadness. I can't imagine. No more tears. No more problems. Glory in the very presence of God, who's light, who's the essence of love, who is everything, and I'll be there. You know, I think about those few moments. I know it's a little strange, but I'm thinking, oh, 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 man. And you know what? Just between me and you, it almost happened right before Joey was born. I almost did. I'll tell you the story one day. I felt my, my wife knows and some people know the story. I was in a hospital and I was bleeding out. They couldn't stop the blood and I felt my spirit leaving my body. And uh, it's a long story, but you know what I was thinking? It was on a, on a flash. It happened in a flash. I didn't plan to say this. I don't know why I'm saying it now, but God knows what he's doing. I was thinking about my wife and about the baby I hadn't met. She was at term, maybe two weeks to go. And I was thinking, oh, man. It would have been great to have seen the baby. And my wife is going to be alone now, but God is going to take care of her. And I felt this glory come over me, not any fright or anything. It was like, <gasps> as that glory was pulling me towards glory, towards heaven or whatever. And it was... I didn't have, I couldn't speak. And I remembered that, well, I started singing a hymn in my mind that we sometimes sing here. Uh, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the folly of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Lord, it's now. And listen to the other verse. I love thee in life, and I'll love thee in death. I'll love thee as long as thou lendest me breath. I'll say when the death dew lies cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Lord, it's now. And that's exactly what I was feeling. Boy, do I love you. Boy, am I heading towards glory. But then all of a sudden, I was back. <laughs> it got snatched away. And I was on a table, and a team, and a, a, a doctor with nurses were all around me working feverishly to bring me back. And they were successful because... My time here was not finished yet. But let me tell you something. It's glorious. I didn't even, you know, I didn't make the trip, but just 
Starting the head there was pretty amazing. Listen, there's nothing, nothing in this earth. There's nothing that you can buy. There's no big house that you can have. There's no huge car. There's no toy. There's no vacation that you can take that's going to satisfy you and keep satisfying you. It's all going to pass away. That's why it says the world and its desires pass away. But for us, whoever does the will of God lives forever. And that's what I was feeling. I was feeling life. I was feeling I'm not heading towards death. Oh my goodness, I'm heading towards life itself. Because when you head towards God, God is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when you head towards God here on this earth, you're heading towards life. If this body passes away, then your spirit and your soul head towards life until this body is resurrected a little while later. Oh, do we have a destiny. It's a new destiny. And not only that, we also have a new legacy when we're under management, new management. Because if we do this right, then our children will want to follow. And if we do it right, their children will want to follow. And their children's children, and their children's children's children, and their children's 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 children. To the thousandth generation, the Word of God promises us that the legacy continues. No matter what your legacy was before, once you receive Jesus, it's brand new. You just started a new line. And that line leads to life. But you have to let yourself be managed. You have to give it up. The old things are gone. They're gone. The new life has come. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Hallelujah. If there's someone here who hasn't begun their journey, you've never received Jesus into your life, don't leave here without life. If there's someone here who God is speaking to, would you raise your hand so that you can start? God will see your hand and you can start your new journey with him. Life forevermore. Anybody in the building that has not made that decision? Amen. For all of us, I know that, I know many of you, and I know one thing, I know you love the Lord. But you know you can love the Lord and fool around with old management things. Maybe you have an old employee manual from the old management and you need to get rid of it you need to be radical and say you know what I'm turning everything over I'm going to follow Jesus no turning back I'm going to look to see if there's anything from the old life and I'm going to get rid of it if that's you I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray with you I see your hand yes all over the building Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I just thank you, oh God, Lord, that you're a God that doesn't condemn us, Lord God. You prod our hearts, oh God. You reason with us, Lord God. Lord, you do something through your Holy Spirit, which is called conviction, Lord God. You point things out in our life because you love us, Lord God. You lovingly point out things, oh God, that we need to hand to you that maybe we've kept for ourselves. And God, Lord, you see the hands that are raised in this building, Lord God. These are your children, oh God. And Lord, they're asking God for, Lord, that new management to take over, oh God, which is you. It's your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, for a new strength, oh God. I pray, God, for a new desire, God, that you would put new and fresh desires in, Lord God, my brothers and sisters' hearts. Oh, God, so that, Lord, they will follow you no matter what. 
when the fork in the road is presented, God, and there's your way or another way, God, they will always find themselves choosing your way, oh God, and that's it. I pray, Father, that you would guide their footsteps, that your word would be a lamp for their feet, oh God, and a guide to their path, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father, that their hearts, oh God, will be fully circumcised, oh God, so that they could love you with all of their heart and soul and live, oh God. I pray, Father, that whatever God has been, Lord God, impeding, Lord God, everything that you want to do in their life, oh God, Lord, that, uh, Lord, you would do surgery and that they will allow you to do surgery, oh Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God. So in the end, oh Lord God, Lord, that makeover will have us all looking like your son, Jesus. Hallelujah. That transformation will take place. God, we thank you that you do that in us and through us, Lord. It's not about us trying hard. It's not about willpower. It's about your power. It's about the Holy Spirit causing transformation and a change in, our, in renewing even our minds, oh God. So, Lord, we thank you, Father, for these transactions that are happening right now. Father, we receive them and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand? Let's sing. I, I want to thank God for his mercy. Let's sing that again. And we'll go out knowing about God's great and rich mercy. Hallelujah. How many are thankful for the mercy of God? Listen, I want to just say one last word to you before we all go out and have a little time of fellowship. How many are under new management? Raise your hand. That means we work for the same company. We work for the company of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen? And as fellow company members, we can encourage each other. We can help each other. We can love on each other. We can fellowship with each other. We can do life with each other. Amen? And here's what I want you to remember. Remember your destiny. That is, it's coming. But remember your legacy. The effect of your decisions in this life of what they will they will continue to go on forever and ever and ever and ever my mom is living that out she's in heaven right now but her legacy is being played out same thing on my sister's side her children 
are serving Christ. My children are serving Christ. Not because we're good people. Because God is an awesome God. Amen. But please walk God knowing that his mercy is great. His plan is amazing. Your legacy is coming. Your destiny is secure. You're God's chosen people. God bless you. Don't forget Tuesday night. Come and pray with us and see God answer some prayers. We want to see God do what we don't expect and what we can't do. How many say amen? God bless you. We'll see you out there during our time of fellowship.